hi, everyone. Uh, glad everyone can join us uh, this evening for our uh, Area of the Month Secrets of the USMLA, how to dissect any question on testing. Today, we have a very special edition. It is our cardio edition. So uh, this is a topic that is near and dear to many of us uh, and is particularly high yield on the USMLA Step 1. Uh, so, but before I get going, I, you know, just I want to introduce myself again. My name is Tao Lee. I am uh, an associate clinical professor of allergy and immunology at the University of Louisville, uh, but I'm better known as the senior editor for first aid for the USMLA series, as well as US Linear X, uh, uh, you know, QBank, and also all our Scholar X uh, uh, brick resources. Um, we've got uh, uh, you know my co-presenter, uh, uh, Bras. Bras, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Um, hey guys, my name is Paris. I'm a dermatology resident uh, here in Dallas at UT Southwestern. Um, I'm also an RX coach with USMLE RX, so I help uh, work one-on-one -on -one with students to help prepare them for the uh, USMLE Step 1, Step 2 CK as well, and I'm happy to help uh, with tonight's session. Great, fantastic. So Paris will uh, be, you know, uh, you know, taking us through a number of question dissections, but we also have some outstanding RX coach panelists. So uh, first up, I want to introduce uh, Sean, Sean Nanji. Thank you, Dr. Lee. Hello, everyone. Uh, Sean Nanji here. Been with RS Coach for over two years now, working with our coaches and students to help them on their academic journey. Happy to be here as always, and I look forward to answering your questions. Great, fantastic. So, uh, so while we're doing the presentation, Brian and Sean uh, will be happy to answer any questions you have about just preparing for the boards, what coaching is like, what coaching can do for you, uh, and you know, um, you know, and 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 uh, uh, and, and, and uh, you know whether you uh, um, you know whether you like to uh, do a coaching coaching consultation. Uh, so that you know, you know, just you can reach them in the uh, Q and A panel that's on the right side of your application. If you're on a PC or Mac, if you're on a uh, tablet or a mobile phone, uh, you know, you should be able to select it from the uh, the menu, uh, the menu options, whether they put it where, wherever they put it in Android or iOS. Uh, so uh, that's uh, that that. And, you know, a couple other things before we get going, we will have a, you know, our usual raffle drawing uh, for, you know, uh, some RX coaching as well as access to using RX360. You do need to be present uh, or at least present towards the end because uh, Louise, our, you know, who's, who's helping run this, will draw your name, but she's only going to draw your name if you're around at the time. So do stick around for the entire session. Uh, and so, again, that, uh, you know, in terms of the agenda, we already did the intros. We'll talk about USMLE updates, our approach to questions, question dissections, which is what Paras uh, uh, will be going through, uh, some advice. As I mentioned, the, the raffle and special offer at the end to make things even more affordable and high yield for you. And then we'll open up for Q&A, so you can ask our coaches any question you want um, and uh, go from there. And so, as promised, here are the current US only updates. This is obviously evolving on a monthly basis, and so do tune in so you know you can hear about the changes. As, as of now, we are expecting pass-fail to occur starting in late January. Um, they're going to be more specific as the date comes, but right now it's no earlier than that. They could certainly further delay it. So, that's why it's phrased as no earlier than January 26. Um, the other the other thing that's kind of emerged, uh, you know, uh, is the details of how they're going to report the pass fail. If you pass, that's all they're going to tell you. If you fail, they're going to give you kind of a, some visual indicator about how close you were to passing, and they're also going to give you some content area feedback about where you might have ex you know scored lower or higher than other examinees who 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 you know, are you who did pass, but it was a low pass. So you can kind of get a sense of the gaps that you might want to address or close. Um, so that's that's what we know so far. You know, come back, you know, to a future uh, secret session, and we'll we'll update you there. Uh, and you know, uh, we already you you already knew about this, but they have recently implemented you know the the uh, a change in their in the number of attempts that you can take. You know, as reported, they've taken it as they were going to do. They have now taken from six attempts to four attempts per step. Um, and uh, so those are the updates. All right. So, again, with regards to USMLE, you know, step one, um, it is 
it is really only one type of questions, one best answer item or question items. A handful of these have multimedia, so that that is a variant. Most of them are case-based or clinical vignette. You know, that's you know well over 80% of the team, uh, the exam. And about half, if not a little more than half, are multi-step reasoning. So that means they integrate multiple concepts. They may start with some pathology where you have to make the diagnosis, but then it, it asks you about mechanism disease or some genetics or uh, something around, uh, you know, statistics uh, or, you know, uh, you know, uh, pharmacology, you know, uh, so, um, so that's how you might see multi-step, you know, uh, scenarios crop up on the exam, you know, for, you know, in terms of this, uh, you know, question types, step one generally, you know, uh, is more about mechanism, even though, you know, it obviously starts with a diagnosis. That's really where they're going with step two. It tends to be more about diagnosis and some management and step three, it's more about management. All right. Uh, on the USMLE blueprint, uh, you know, uh, you know, they've, th there's, there's been some shifting, particularly with uh, a big increase in communications and interpersonal skills. That is definitely higher than they were last year. Uh, there's still obviously a fair amount. But the, 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 the main, the main thrust of the, of the, of the exam is still about medical knowledge, uh, particularly with foundational science concept, but often in a clinical scenario. Uh, and as I mentioned, there is some patient diagnosis, but very little with regards to management and a little bit with regards to practice-based learning and improvement. A lot of the ethics um, uh, and uh, healthcare quality and healthcare delivery type questions, uh, a, a number of those have shifted to step two CK. All right. So with that, I'm going to now pass it over to uh, uh, Paras, who will you know, take you through our RX coach approach to dissecting, di dissecting questions. So handing it over. Thank you, Dr. Lee. So um, we'll kind of go over, uh, you know, there, there are a few different approaches to board questions. And uh, today we'll be using the question approach that we use in our RX Coach program. So uh, for those of you who haven't heard of RX Coach, it's our tutoring initiative. Uh, we'll talk about it later in the webinar. Um, but we'll kind of go ahead now and talk about our seven step approach to questions. So we'll go over these steps now and then we'll do some questions together so that you can become familiar with it. So step number one is to cover up the answer choices. You can use a post-it note, some paper. Um, and the reason we ask that you do this is we don't want you to become preoccupied by the answer choices and we don't want them to guide your thinking before you've even read the question, okay? So now we'll move on to step number two on the next slide. And at this point, we will read the last sentence first. And as we do that, we'll highlight and make note of what we believe is important. Um, we do this so that we know what to look for as we read the question. And with any luck, this will help us avoid having to reread the question and waste precious time. So now we'll move on to the next slide, step number three. For this step, uh, we want you to think about how many steps does this question require to get to the correct answer? So, you know, it can be a one-step question, a two-step, a three-step. So what does that mean? So, you know, if, the, if it's just a diagnosis question, that's probably just a one-step question. Um, if it's asking you how to treat a condition, you know, that could be two steps. One, finding the diagnosis, and then two, knowing the treatment for that. If it asks you for the mechanism of action, of the agent used to treat this condition, well, then you can see that there's an additional third step, knowing the mechanism of action of that drug, okay? Like I said, don't worry too much if you don't remember all of this. We're gonna work through these uh, with some questions and dissect them together, okay? Um, but let's talk about why this step is important. Um, this step allows you to have a clear thought process as you approach the question. So by knowing how many steps it'll take, you can avoid having to reread the question and you can start looking for subtle clues that'll help you answer each of those steps, okay? So let's move on to the next slide, step number four. And on this one, we, we're gonna read the question one sentence at a time. And after each sentence, we will highlight and make note of what is important while simultaneously thinking of what we should take away from that sentence. So um, this will help us remain consistent with the question approach and keep our thought process in check. Um, and, and, you know, today we'll kind of walk through that a little bit about, um, you know, what should you be taking away after each sentence. On the next slide, step number five. So once we've read that whole question, we're going to reread that last sentence, okay? 
And at this point, we want you to start thinking of potential and potential answer choices and trying to narrow those down in your mind. So before we even get to the answer choices, we want you to start coming up with an answer on your own, okay? Really start to get that brain working. So let's move on to the next slide, and there you'll see step number six. This is the easy, easiest step, and this is where you uncover those answer choices, okay? Step number seven on the next slide for this step, um, we will start at the last answer and we'll work our way up, okay? So we do this to make sure that students are looking at all of the answer choices before picking an answer, and they're not becoming distracted by an answer they think is correct, but may actually be incorrect, okay? So we recommend starting at the bottom or the last answer choice um, and crossing out answer choices that don't fit with what you had been thinking about before you uncovered the answer choices. And hopefully you'll find an answer choice that fits your thought process. And even better yet, you may find one that was the exact same answer, okay? So let's move on to the next slide. And what we're gonna do is we have a couple questions here that we're gonna go over and um, dissect together, okay? So we will move on to step number one, and we're gonna un uh, cover up those answer choices. Now in this question, um, a little bit diff uh, diff uh, difficult because um, you know, the, the answer choices are you know, essentially those rows in the table, um, but we've just gone ahead and covered up those answer choices. But um, essentially, the, we'll, we'll move on to step number two, and what that says is which of the hemodynamic profiles shown in the table would be most likely in this patient, okay? So um, as you're doing that, we would want you to highlight what you think is important. So now we'll move on to step number three and figure out how many steps this question requires, okay? So by looking at this, we can tell this is maybe a two-step question, okay? First, we need to come up with the diagnosis here, and then two, what would the hemodynamic profile in that diagnosis be, okay? So now we'll move on to step number four, and we'll read that question one sentence at a time. And we recommend when you do this that you pause briefly after each sentence uh, to highlight if needed, and then ask yourself things like, you know, what is important in this sentence? What, what are the clues here that I should be picking up on? So for today's purposes, uh, I'll kind of take a brief pause after each sentence and allow you to gather your thoughts, okay? So let's go ahead and read this question. A 76-year-old man is brought to the emergency department with altered mental status. His temperature is 102.6 degrees Fahrenheit, pulse is 125 beats per minute, blood pressure is 78 over 45, and oxygen saturation is 97% on room air. His white blood cell count is 27,700. His urine is cloudy with bacteria and multiple white blood cells. So now we'll move on to step number five, and we're going to reread that last sentence. Which of the hemodynamic profiles shown in the table would be most likely in this patient? So I want you guys to take a look at those column headers, cardiac output, pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, systemic vascular resistance, and start thinking to yourself, what changes would you expect in this, uh, in this, uh, this patient, okay? So step number six, um, we've kind of already done this, but we're, you know, we'll uncover those answer choices, um, which in this case you can tell is just gonna be uh, choice A through E, okay? And so now we'll move on to step number seven. And for this, we want you to kind of go through those answer choices one by one, starting at the bottom and working your way up to the top. So starting at answer choice E, look at those profiles, look at those arrows, um, up and down arrows or normal arrows, um, and see if they correlate with what you were thinking for each of those columns, okay? So we'll kind of wait a second for you guys to do that. Um, and then we'll go ahead and uh, after we've given you a couple seconds, we'll open up the poll. Um, we'll let you guys select what you think is the best answer choice here and we'll talk about it in just a few seconds. All right, I'm going to go open up the poll, A, B, C, D, E, you know, uh, and then you'll have an opportunity to lock in your answers. So let me do that. All right, so we'll go ahead and launch the poll. Let us know what you think. All 
All right, looks like about 20% uh, um, of you have answered. Let's keep it coming. Remember on the USMLA, there is no penalty for incorrectly guessing the answer. So, you know, you know, our, our, our typical uh, rule of thumb is, you know, spend about 60 to 70 seconds to try to solve the question. If you haven't been able to, then go ahead and commit to your best answer. Mark it, you think it's solvable, and then try to come back. If you commit to that, you'll have you'll have uh, you know uh, time to you know maybe five, you know eight to ten minutes at the very end to go back and, and de uh, you know you know go after a, a handful of solvable questions. All right, looks like we've got about two thirds have answered. I will go ahead and close the response. I don't think anybody else is answering, uh, and uh, I'll share the response. And what we see is that uh, um, you know 32% have answered D. Uh, followed by, uh, you know, 21% for A and 14% for E. All right, so let's uh, let's let's see what um, let's go forward and then let's see what uh, the actual answer is. And it is um, it is indeed D. All right, fantastic. So you guys are doing great. I'm going to pass it back for us to walk us through the the the, the rationale here. Yeah, absolutely. Great job, guys. So. Um, hopefully you guys were able to pick up a few things. You know, this gentleman has a fever. He's got hypotension. Um, he has leukocytosis. Um, and then we're told about some urine findings, so bacteria in the urine. Um, so probably suggesting that he had a urinary tract infection that then developed into sepsis, okay? So he likely is in what we would call distributive shock secondary to sepsis, okay? Now, in this type of shock, uh, distributive shock, um, you would develop um, low systemic vascular resistance um, in response to the blood pressure being low, the sympathetic nervous system would increase mm -hmm. cardiac output by increasing heart rate and stroke volume, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and on top of that, in septic shock, the central venous pressure and, and wedge pressure, um, it can de it can vary depending on fluid intake, but they're often slightly low um, because of uh, capillary leak induced by the sepsis. So you would have low extracellular volume, okay? So if you're wondering about the other answer choices, answer choice E would be, um, you know, if you had a normal patient who was given a transfusion or a saline infusion, um, answer choice C would be seen in patients with cardiogenic shock where you have low cardiac mm -hmm. output. Um, answer choice B would be seen in patients with hypovolemic shock, um, low cardiac output, and also low pulmonary capillary wedge pressure, and that differentiates it from C, where it's in cardiogenic shock that, that wedge pressure is high. And then lastly, answer choice A, that would be patients with neurogenic shock. So hopefully you guys are able to see um, why that's the best answer. So great job on this one. Uh, we've used our approach and covered uh, uh, one question together. Um, so let's move on to the next question to kind of hammer home some of these steps. Um, so now we have question number two, and we'll once again, um, we will cover up the answer choices. That is step number one, okay? So then we'll move on to step number two. We're going to read that last sentence first. Which of the following ion channels is most responsible for the observed arrhythmia? And hopefully, like uh, Dr. Lee is doing there, uh, when you guys are, are going through that, you're highlighting what you think is important. So now we'll move on to step number three and try to figure out how many steps is this question. Well, I think um, one, I think, you know, I think this is maybe a three-step question. I think we need to figure out maybe the diagnosis here. I think then we need to know maybe the mechanism of the diagnosis. Um, and then maybe what is the, the third step would be maybe the normal function um, in terms of ion channels. Um, so maybe a two or three step question here. Okay, definitely a multi-step question. So now we'll move on to step number four and we'll read that question one sentence at a time. A 71 year old woman comes to the physician for a routine examination. She says she feels well. She has a history of diabetes mellitus and hypertension, well controlled on metformin and enalapril. The ECG is shown. 
So now that we've read that question, we'll move on to step number five and we'll reread that last sentence. Which of the following ion channels is most responsible for the observed arrhythmia? So we'll let you guys take a look at that EKG. And we'll go ahead and uh, move on to step number six, where we uncover those answer choices. And then we will show those to you now. And with this, uh, we will move on to step number seven. Uh, we want you to start at answer choice E and work your way up. So uh, I'll go ahead and read those out now. Answer choice E, transient T-type calcium channels. D, potassium protein channels. C, fast voltage-gated sodium channels. B, cyclic nucleotide-gated funny cation channels. And A, L-type calcium channels. So hopefully you guys got a good look at that EKG. We'll give you guys a couple more seconds and then we'll open up that poll um, and then we'll talk about this in just a few seconds. All right, very good. Let me go ahead and open up the poll and uh, you, uh, in the meantime, lock in an answer. All right. Opening up the poll. So go ahead and tell us what channel you think is responsible for this particular arrhythmia. We've got about 15% responded. Keep going. Again, no, no penalty for guessing. All right, we're up to about a quarter. All right, nearly half of you responded, which is great. Keep it coming. All right, uh, looks like we're up to about two thirds. Uh, so I think that's plenty good work. Three quarters now, so I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the response. And we have a clear preference here for answer D, okay? Potassium uh, protein channels. Uh, in number two and number three are the fast, fast voltage gauge sodium channels and the calcium channels. So let's, uh, Let's go ahead and hide the responses and then get actually to the actual answer, which is B. All right, let's definitely talk about this. Only 9% chose this, so the cyclic uh, nucleated funny cation channels. Yeah, definitely a tough question here. So um, if we take a look at that ECG or EKG, what we see there um, you can see that those complexes are pretty spaced out, okay? Um, and this patient actually has sinus bradycardia, okay? Um, and the heart rate, if you calculate it, I believe, is actually around 45 beats per minute in this patient, so pretty low, okay? Um, now, sinus bradycardia can be seen in healthy people who are very well conditioned, like runners or athletes. Um, if they take certain medications like a beta blocker, um, or even elderly patients uh, in the absence of heart disease, okay? Now, there are disorders that can cause sinus bradycardia as well. Um, sinoatrial or SA node disease specifically, um, hard uh, previous MIs. Um, so we know, um, you know, that the SA node is uh, one of the pacemakers and that can cause sinus bradycardia, okay? The heart rate is determined by the SA node. And if you have pathologic cause um, or pathologic involvement of this pacemaker, that can lead to sinus bradycardia, okay? Now, the SA node is made up of cardiac pacemaker cells, okay? It's important to differentiate those pacemaker cells um, and pacemaker uh, um, cardiac cycle and, and depolarization and, and hyperpolarization um, from regular myocyte cells, okay? These nodal pacemaker cells, they're characterized by automaticity or spontaneous depolarization. Um, in pacemaker cells, you have hyperpolarization activated cyclic nucleotide gated uh, funny cation channels. So once again, I'll say that, that was a lot of words, but hyperpolarization activated. So hyperpolarization activates these cyclic funny cation channels. 
to allow for increased membrane permeability um, of sodium to move the resting membrane potential closer to threshold, okay? So the slope of that line and the activity of these channels is what determines the heart rate, okay? If it's, um, the slope is very high, you would have a increased heart rate. If the slope is uh, decreased, you would have a slower heart rate and that could lead to sinus bradycardia, okay? So knowing what channels um, dictate the, the slope of that curve um, is important to answering this question. So some of the other answer choices here, transient T-type calcium channels, um, this is more towards the end of phase four and less dictating of the slope. Uh, potassium pro, uh, protein channels, this is mainly for membrane repolarization, okay, not so much with um, the slope of the curve and depolarization. Um, L-type calcium channels as well, I believe that was uh, highly selected as well. Um, that allows for calcium to enter the cell and generate an action potential in general, um, but the best answer here uh, would be uh, B, and knowing that these are specifically kind of those what they call funny cation channels um, responsible for um, the automaticity and slope of those pacemaker cells. Um, so great job here. Oh, and sorry, the, the other answer choice, answer choice C, that has to do with um, cardiac myocytes. So not the pacemaker cells, but those are the different types of cells. Remember I said that's important to differentiate between those two, okay? So great job on this question. I know it was a tough question, um, but let's do one more question together using our approach. Hopefully you guys can solidify that approach um, with another last question. So um, once again, we will move on to question number three and we will move to step one. We will cover up those answer choices. You can see we've already gone ahead and done that. Step number two, let's read that last sentence first. Which of the following is the most likely adverse effect of hydralazine that caused the phys physician to reject its use in this patient? So like Dr. Lay is doing, um, in, you're going to highlight what you think is important in that lead-in question. So now we'll move on to step number three. Maybe try to figure out how many steps is this question. Well, I think um, this could be, uh, uh, it's at least a one-step question. I think we need to know what the adverse effects of hydralazine are, but I think we then may need to take it a further step and then um, figure out, apply it to this patient and which of those adverse effects uh, was specifically the reason for um, not using it in this patient. So at least one step of knowing those adverse effects and maybe an additional step there as well. So now let's move on to step number four and let's read this question one sentence at a time. A 70-year-old man comes to the physician because of worsening shortness of breath and ankle edema. He has a history of refractory hypertension, two-vessel coronary artery disease, and congestive heart failure treated with multiple medications. As an alternative drug for heart failure, his physician considers adding hydralazine, but decides against it because of the drug's adverse effects. So now we're gonna move on to step number five, and let's reread that last sentence one more time. So which of the following is most likely adverse effect of hydralazine that caused the phys physician to reject its use? So once again, take a, take a second to think of what the answer choice could be before we even uncover those answer choices. And this will really help you do well on step one. So we'll give you guys a second. Now we'll move on to step number six, the favorite step of uncovering those answer choices. We'll show them to you now. And once again, we have five answer choices. And once again, uh, we will move on to step number seven. We'll go through those answer choices. And I'm going to start at the bottom. And I'm going to work my way up to the top like we recommend. Answer choice E, hypercalcemia. D, bradycardia. C, anuria. B, angioedema, and A, angina. So we'll give you guys a few seconds to start thinking of your thoughts, gathering your thoughts. We'll uh, open up that poll in a couple seconds and we will talk about it in just a few seconds.
All right, uh, we've got 72 percent responding. So let's go ahead and close the poll. I'm going to share the responses, and we've got a nice spread here. Uh, a is in the lead with angina, followed by B, angioedema, and D, bradycardia. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, hide that and then get to the actual answer, uh, which is A, angina. Fantastic. Good job, guys. Yeah, absolutely. Great job, guys. Definitely a nice cardio farm question. So hydralazine can cause tachycardia, okay? And then it can also, as a result, cause chest pain and angina, especially in patients with coronary artery disease like our patient was, okay? So hydralazine can oftentimes be added for congestive heart failure, especially in the setting of uh, along with nitrates, okay? It's a vasodilator, and that vasodilation of arterioles helps to reduce the afterload on the heart. So it makes it useful in the setting of heart failure. However, it may decrease blood pressure significantly as well. And as you know, if you decrease blood pressure, one of the things the body may do is it may have reflex tachycardia to maintain that cardiac output, okay? So this may cause demand ischemia, um, and as a result can cause angina, and especially in the setting of this patient who's got coronary artery disease, okay? Now, other adverse effects that maybe could also have contributed to this physician not adding it um, is peripheral edema, okay? Uh, but, you know, in this setting, the ankle edema is likely due to the heart failure, so treating that would maybe help the ankle edema first. So in this question, I think angina is a really good thing to think about um, and, and, and worrying about adding it to this patient. So great job here. Uh, just to quickly round out the other answer choices, hypercalcemia. Um, with that, you know, you really should be thinking about thiazide diuretics, uh, bradycardia, more so beta blockers, uh, aneurea is um, maybe more so in the setting of uh, kidney injury, so maybe a drug that has uh, nephrotoxic effects. Um, and angioedema, uh, that would be more so with ACE inhibitors, um, so nothing really there that hydralazine would be related to. So hopefully you guys were able to get the hang of our approach and it's becoming familiar to you guys. So great job on tonight's question, and I will hand it back to you, Dr. Lee. All right, fantastic. Thanks, Ross, for taking everyone through these outstanding question dissections from QMAX. All right, so, you know, it, to sum up, you know, what, what you saw Ross did, did you need to have an approach, right? You know, you know he, he took you through our, our very uh, specific RX coach approach, which works for a, a wide variety of students preparing for the USMLA. Uh, you, know, um, you, know, uh, you know, so, Make sure you use a well, uh, 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 you know, a well-tested technique like like uh, like the technique he just showed. Uh, you know, uh, when you are thinking about an answer, you know, as you saw, we we you know, you have to read through everything, but in a very specific sequence that allows you to process it in a logical fashion, right? Uh, and then, uh, um, you know, you also have to think about how the question can bring in related concepts, right? Whether it's a you know a one-step diagnosis question or that three-step diagnosis question, where it's the diagnosis, the rhythm, and the mechanism, you know, uh, you know that that trigger the rhythm and and the ion channels that are involved in you know in in in, in generating that uh, sinus bradycardia rhythm, right? Um, and you know when you think about approaching uh, the USMLA, uh, you want to think about um, you know uh, you know getting on, on the right study schedule. And we actually do, we have actually given talks about that in the past. Uh, and, uh, um, you know, uh, Jeff will drop a link into our, our study schedule re resources. Uh, you know, we, we, we also, uh, you know, um, suggest, a, this is actually a typo, um, that you, you know, think about integrating. So, you know, you saw how all those multiple concepts uh, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, can work together. So it's really all about integrating across, uh, um, uh, you know, across multiple disciplines, uh, but in a related fashion. Uh, uh, you, uh, uh, you know, there are certain subject areas like um, metabolic pathways, micro, farm, that tend to be a little bit more crammable because of the way the information structure. If you come to our, uh, you know, uh, you know. Um, 
Path to 250 talk, we talk about what those, you know, uh, how, how to approach that. Um, you want to learn about, uh, you know, focus on things that are either high yield, uh, you know, of course, you know, in, in texts like first aid, but also focus on things that you've learned, you know, uh, before, because that's, that's, those are memories you already have. You're just reactivating. So it's easy to reactivate memories and then to create new memories for the purposes of the USMLA. Also try not to overschedule. Make sure you type, take time for breaks to be a human being. Uh, even when you're in the hardcore dedicated period, uh, you know, either as a, uh, as a, a student in med school, or even you graduate or you're not, uh, you, can, you can often get into a, uh, a bit of a spiral if you, uh, uh, if you don't uh, take time to reconnect. And then, you know, as, I, uh, um, as we talk about in first aid, we want you to stay relaxed and grounded. We have a whole checklist in the front of the book that helps you organize your preparation so that you know, you're well prepared uh, um, and you uh, um, and 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 you feel like you've done this in a very deliberate and logical way, without rushing it and without any risk of panic. All right. Okay. Great. So, uh, um, so you 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 just saw some first rate arts coaching from for us. Uh, you know, this is something that the first aid team in US Rex has been putting together over the last couple of years. Uh, you know, uh, it's uh, something that has been hugely helpful to hundreds of students who have been involved. Uh, it includes, uh, you know, uh, some very unique aspects, such as a as a pre pre test assessment uh, to help find, you know, where your strengths and weaknesses are. That allows us an RX coach to develop a personalized study plan, and then you know go through that plan with a one on one approach. All of our all of our tutors, like uh, Ross, Brian, and Sean, are, have gone through a rigorous certification process. Uh, you know, to make sure that they're, uh, they're de delivering great education value. And it's all combined with, you know, RX360 package and RX Bricks. So that includes our question banks, flashcards, digital videos, as well as our learning bricks. And we've had some fantastic results. We've had students who, you know, you know had increases of 40 to even 80 points uh, from where they started. Uh, we had one recent um, success story where the student uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, started off with an with an OK score, but ended up with 260 on the US Main Step One, and and that person did so well and really enjoyed so much that that person came back, you know, to become an ARCS coach. Sean, you want to say anything about that? Sure. Yeah, that was one of our greatest success stories that we've had. We've had students actually break 260, uh, but this student in particular has a passion for teaching, and we'd love to, you know, uh, hire great talent. As you can see, we have wonderful talent like Forrest and Brian and. 11 other wonderful coaches. So, you know, if we can help her, we can certainly help all of you. And I encourage you all to reach out.